Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well out there. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, if you're popping on live, let me know you're here. Say hello in the chat or in the comments. And it's great to see you. Hey there, Tara. So thanks for tuning in to Healers and Healing. This is a segment or a series that I created for healing arts practitioners to share information about healing, to share information for and about healers. So that's what I'm hopping in to do today. I like to keep these segments short and bite-sized. So this series this week is called Amplify Your Ability to Hold Space. Today is Fundamentals of Healing. The first two in the, in the first, in part one and part two, I covered being a sacred container and creating a protocol for healing. Those replays are still available. They're here. They're actually, I think they might be pinned to the top of the group. So go ahead and check them out as you would, as you would like. Hey, Vanessa. Hey, Beth. Thanks for joining us. Yes. It's great to know who's here. Say hello if you're live. Hey, Lisa, good to see you. So for those of you who are, who are new to me, new to the group, or watching the replay and new to what we do here, I'm Bridget Murphy, and I'm a shamanic practitioner and a mentor, and I help next generation healers to bring the work into the world. I help you to align with the fire so that you can share it with, with everyone who is ready and waiting for you to work with them. And so I offer in-person trainings. I offer shamanic trainings. I offer one-on-one -on -one healing programs and a sacred training for healers. And on Monday, I'm opening up a healers collective, which I'm super excited about. I'll tell you a little bit about that at the end of this um, segment. So here we go. Amplifying your ability to hold space. We covered part one and part two. This is part three, fundamentals of healing. So healing and the definition of healing can be a little different depending on who you are and what your relationship is to healing. For me, healing is a process that leads to wellness. It's whatever your process is that leads to your wellness. That's a simplified way to explain it. Everyone does heal and can heal. And everyone does that on their own timeline. I will often hear people say, when in regards to people, to other people who are on a healing path or maybe are struggling with their health, I'll hear people say, oh, he or she doesn't want to heal. Oh, he or she, they just, you know, they're not ready to heal. And I actually don't believe that. I believe that everybody wants to heal. I believe that the access that people have to healing tools varies depending on their level of privilege, their level of what they were, have been offered in their life. And so um, given what you know and what you are, what's made available to you, you may or may not have the tools that others have in order to heal. I believe everyone wants to heal and I believe it looks different for everybody. And even when we don't think healing is happening, it's happening, even when it doesn't meet our standards or if it doesn't look like we know it could look, it, that, that doesn't matter, healing is still happening. So it's also important to differentiate the difference between healing and curing. Curing typically means that the thing that hurts someone or that caused them stress in their body or mind is completely, absolutely gone. That's what curing means. Healing doesn't mean curing. 
healing can happen without a person being cured. So important to differentiate that. And you need to be okay with that. If you're holding space for other people, you need to be okay with the fact that the healing work happens in the journey to wellness and that the end result is not always that someone's going to be cured of what they're working on. Um, healing means that we're holding a supportive space with the goal of alleviating suffering. And the alleviation of suffering will look different depending on the person who is in the position of being on their wellness path, on their healing path. Which brings me to the, the realization, not the realization, but the sharing of the knowing that healing can, healing can be messy. And when people are suffering, they can be hard to deal with. There's a little bit of like this, this energy out on the internet and maybe it's happening live too where people who do energy healing are very consumed with this love and light and this, this idea that healing is just peaceful and blissful and doing healing work is just going to bring you bliss. And I don't know about y'all, but I've been doing healing work for 20 years and I know that that's not always the case, that when people are in a place of suffering... There's not a lot of bliss and the movement and the growth happens incrementally. And as a healer or somebody who holds space for healing, we need to look at like what the long haul looks like because somebody's healing process over here might be two months. Somebody's healing process over here might be three years. And within that three years, there's a lot that can happen. Um, and when people are suffering, it can be really, they can be hard to deal with. And if you're not prepared for that, you're going to wind up taking it personally. You're going to wind up taking their stuff personally. And it's important to know and to remember that healing and holding a space, well, holding a space for people doesn't always feel good. Doesn't always feel good. If you're working with people and they're in a process or they have a great deal of suffering, they may not leave your table or leave your treatment or leave your session feeling blissed out. And just because they're not blissed out does not mean you've failed as a healer. You need to look at it over the long haul. You know, there's a difference between somebody who wants to go for a energy treatment to remove a block that has no, they, they, they want to remove a perceived block or a block in an area of their body versus someone who's dealing with severe chronic pain or PTSD. There's a very big difference between how those people will present and what they will be experiencing. And you may not always know um, what's happening for a person. You may not always know how to respond. And sometimes there's this kind of need to want to fix or make people feel better. Sometimes there's even a need to convince somebody that you can help them. And I want to encourage you to recognize when that comes up in yourself. Take a breath and recognize that as a healer and a helper, your job is not to convince someone that you can heal them. It's not to convince someone of how they're going to feel or even convince them of your modality. Your job is to hold a space of knowing. Of course, you bring your modalities. Of course, you bring your tools and your techniques. But you hold a space of knowing and you invite them into that without convincing them or anything like that. A student of mine a while back was asked to do some healing sessions for somebody who didn't believe in, in energy healing at all. And my student started to work or was open to working with this person who didn't believe in energy healing at all. And my student started to have her buttons pushed because she felt like she needed to convince this person that she could help them. Once she realized it wasn't her job to convince, it was her job to invite, everything shifted. So that's an important thing. 
Another important thing is, is that when people are in incredible amounts of pain, they're cranky. Not everybody's going to show up all happy and love and light if they're really in need of healing. When people are in incredible amounts of pain, they're cranky and or they project stuff onto you. It's not your job to fix all what they're, it's not your job to address all the things they're projecting on you. Don't take it personally. Keep saying that over and over again because it's important. I have um, quite a few clients who suffer from insomnia. And if you've ever worked with someone who hasn't slept well in a year, you recognize that they are cranky. Sometimes they're nasty. Sometimes people, when they don't sleep, are mean. And I get it because that's what happens. When you don't sleep for a while, it can change your personality. And so recognizing that, again, someone who hasn't slept for a while is not going to show up and be like, la, heal me. They're probably going to be pissed. They're probably not going to be able to look at the bigger picture. And they're probably not going to be able to like go into the metaphysics of why they're not sleeping. People don't need that. If people aren't sleeping, they need you to do what you do to help to encourage them to sleep. They don't need it psychoanalyzed. So it's important to remember that in those cases, people sometimes are cranky. And it's also important to recognize that trauma shows up. Trauma shows up every once in a while, if not more often. And healing arts practitioners are not trained psychologists. They're not supposed to be. I always refer out when I'm working with someone who I know needs um, more mental health support. I work with people who are working with mental health providers and we do our work in conjunction with that but I always refer out I never take on anything that is bigger than what I know and so with that we have to expect trauma to show up and we have to expect it to surprise us sometimes because if you're not a trauma expert you're going to be surprised at how trauma presents itself in the body and the mind of a potential client particularly if you're doing more than one session with them but it can also happen in one session I remember um, a while back I was at a Reiki share and there were um, multiple tables that had um, multiple practitioners across each table. I guess there was four or five practitioners, one person on the table. We were doing 30 minute treatments. Um, there was no like dialoguing or processing. It was just straight up Reiki. And the woman who was on the table at the time started to have a very interesting reaction to Reiki. Now, as we know, Reiki helps to body, to balance the body and the mind and to encourage wellness. It's not digging stuff up. It's not moving things around. It's not extracting things. It's just the light touch, right? And under that light touch, people can have all sorts of different experiences. So this particular woman started to um, get really fidgety on the table and then she didn't move at all. And I was sensing that something was happening for her. So I started to talk with her. And what we found out was she was actually in the middle of a flashback from trauma. It wasn't anything she brought to the table. It wasn't anything that was on the top of her mind. She was someone who was familiar with her own trauma, familiar with her own trauma. And this caught her off guard. And so we took it slow. I talked with her. I figured out what was going to be the best in the moment. Is it going to be best for you to stay on the table and we'll continue to, to talk or be quiet? Or is it going to be best for you to sit up and have a glass of water? I let her tell me what was going to be best for her. And I wouldn't have anticipated, and I'm pretty trauma informed, I wouldn't have anticipated that that would have happened in an under 30 minute Reiki session where Everything was just chill and relaxed. So it's just a good example that trauma shows up and you need to be prepared for it. You don't need to be hyper vigilant around it, but you need to be prepared that sometimes when things don't look familiar or when people have reactions that you're not used to, they can be based in their trauma. That's a fundamental of healing for sure. Another fundamental of healing is that you need to expect that grief shows up. Grief shows up in unexpected times and places. 
And you may have somebody who comes to a treatment or a healing session with you who doesn't know they have grief. And so when that shows up, you need to be okay with it. You need to be okay with people crying. I have a rule in a lot of my trainings, all of my trainings actually, we have tissues <clears throat> in the room and anybody can pull a tissue whenever they want. When someone is sharing something that's emotional and they start crying, nobody hands them a tissue. Now the fixers always want to fix and always want to soothe and want to do the right thing. And at the same time, and that's all nice, but at the same time, even handing somebody a tissue can break them out of a release that they need to have. So be okay with crying. Let people know. I'll leave it at that. Be okay with crying. Don't stop somebody from crying to make yourself feel better. Validate their feelings. All right. Take a little pause here. Take a drink of water. Okay. If you're hopping on now, go ahead and say hi. Let me know how you're doing. Let me know who's here. This is part three in a series that's called Amplify Your Ability to Hold Space. Part one and part two were about creating a container, creating protocols for healing, and this is about the fundamentals of healing. And so expecting grief to show up was where I left off. A couple of other things to expect. One of them is people's responses to what's happening on the planet may be very different than your personal response. And as a healer and a space holder, it's not your job to convince them of what you think is right. It's your job to hold a space for wherever they're at. Two examples I can think of that are top of mind that are very pertinent to what's going on on the planet is people's response to COVID. People's response to the coronavirus might be very different than yours. And you need to not act shocked or afraid or mad or angry if people are more concerned about it than you are or less concerned about it than you are. You just have to hold a space for where they're at. Their healing session, their healing process is not about you. It's about them, which means you have to hold off and, not ex and, ex and, and hold the space for them. The other thing that's really important is um, expect people's response to the racial injustice that's happening on the planet to be different from yours. Everyone's response to racial injustice comes from their own personal lived experience. And so if you don't have the same personal lived experience as the person that's coming for a treatment, you have to expect that um, and anticipate that their response might be different from yours. And even if you do have the same lived experience, their response might be different. Again, holding the space without trying to change it and just being supportive of where they're at. And if you are a white person who is doing healing work and treatments and you're working with anybody who's other than white, black, brown, people of color, you need to understand that there is a distinct and very real difference with how they are experiencing racial injustice versus how you're experiencing racial injustice. And one of the worst things that you can do, one of the worst things that you can do as a healer and a human is to ignore the fact that their skin tone is different than yours. As a matter of fact, I'll go so far as to suggest that if you're a white healer and you plan on working with people who are not white, do a little education for yourself around what it's like to not be white because that is going to help you as a healer. All right, so um, next fundamental of healing is that healing begins when someone says yes to a session, to a treatment, to a healing process. Healing begins right then and there. You might not see it. They might, the person might not see it, but it happens. Asking for help 
and then committing to receiving it opens up a portal for healing. I can't tell you how many people I do healing processes with. We have a conversation ahead of time, always a conversation ahead of time, and we set up the, I set up the container, which I talked about in part one. And we get our sessions on the calendar, and even before the first session, very often some shifts and some healing are occurring because we don't control the healing. And when the gates are open for healing, spirit, creator, life force, the person's own soul starts to do work with them. So you might not be able to see with your eyes or they might not be able to see it with their eyes or they might. Um, healing is happening when people commit to a session. If they commit to a larger process of multiple sessions, it can be amplified. All right. So last fundamental. Well, yeah, those I think are the fundamentals of healing so far. And of course, people who want to make other people feel better and are here to help and serve can want it to be positive all the time. You might want it to be happy all the time and blissful. And I have to tell you that it's not all flowers and roses. Holding a solid support, a solid healing support for someone is not all flowers and roses. And you need to be prepared for that. You need to be prepared for that. And you need to trust that a person showing up and you doing what you love to do is enough. Because sometimes that's all you got to go on is that trust. And these are all the fundamentals of the fundamentals of understanding healer, healing. A healer's job is to know their modality, but to also know themselves. And this is how we amplify our ability to hold space. So just a, a recap of the fundamentals of healing that I just shared. Everyone can heal and they do it on their own timeline. Healing does not mean curing and you need to be okay with that. Holding a space for people doesn't always feel good. Expect trauma to show up when you're not thinking about it. Expect grief to show up and expect people's response to current events to be different than yours. Example is Corona and racial injustice. And the last one is healing is happening when someone says yes to a session. Those are all fundamentals of healing. I will answer questions in one second. If you have questions, pop them in, pop them in the, the comments here. If you are in a place where you're ready to really hold space for others, and if you want to new ways to work with people to take on clients and get paid for it, to actually make a professional practice or to amplify a professional practice that you already have, the Healers Collective that I'm that I've started opens on January 5th. It starts on January 5th. It opens officially on Monday. And if you're somebody who is ready to actualize your light, not activate, because I know if y'all are here, your light's already activated. If you are ready to actualize the potential of your light, learn how to effectively talk about what you do, how to be confident in sharing what you do and getting paid for it, then we get real with all of that in the Healers Collective. And I give you a step-by-step -step instructions on how to take your work into the world successfully. I see a lot of healers out there who have beautiful gifts and they have no idea how to make it a practice that sustains them. And I'd like to change that because once you learn the skills you need, to that'll give you confidence to take your work further into the world. Once you learn that, the game changes. Everything changes once you have more information. And so that's what the Healers Collective is all about. The, I'm opening up on Monday with a beautiful opportunity for um, anyone who wants to step into this fir first cohort, this first cycle of the Healers Collective. Um, and if you've reached out already to let me know you're interested, thank you. If you haven't yet... Make sure that you do 
you can personal message me and I will respond to you and let you know what to do next. This is only for people who are ready to step up, not for people who are just curious and thinking maybe. It really is a collective of healers who are all building momentum to take their work in the world. So Monday it opens. I'll share more information about it on Monday. Don't miss that because once it's full, we're going to close and, and start rolling in January. All right, let's see. Questions? here. Someone said, could me having cancer affect my healing others even following what you have taught? I think I need more information, Chrissy. I think I need more information about what you mean. Um, if you have cancer, I don't know if you mean you have cancer, you've had cancer in the past. First, I don't, I need clarity on that. And um, the other thing would be there's a point in time in our own healing process that we need to just be unto ourselves and focus on ourselves. If you're at that point in your process, then you shouldn't be working with other people. That's, that's where I would start answering that question. I need more information for you to continue. Yes, Tara, you get it. No tissue passing. Thank you for understanding. <laughs> it feels, it probably feels mean in the beginning, but there's a, there's a method to it. There's a reason for it. Another comment. One thing, that's Christine. One thing I often struggle with is carrying the way I hold space for others in my office, out into the larger world through my personal social media accounts. I tend to forget to put on my practitioner role before spouting off. Thank you for the reminder. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that's probably even a bigger conversation that is probably good to have, right? Yeah. What Vanessa asks, so what is an effective way to invite someone into a healing space when they want help, but they're afraid of their demons? Oh, I would want a specific. I love specifics because I love to give full, rich answers and I need specifics. So an effective, an effective way to invite someone into a healing space. It's really to educate them. I think that letting people know the benefits of whatever type of healing you offer is helpful. That way there's no convincing. It's like if somebody had a migraine and they've got whatever they have happening and I share with them, well, this practice is really effective for migraines because it does A, B, or C. Um, it's not my job, it's not my job to talk them out of their demons. And it may be that if someone has that much fear and has all these demons, that maybe they're not a good fit for your healing pr process right now. That could be the case. I don't ever talk anybody out of their fears. I offer an invitation. I know the result that my work brings. I share what the result is gonna bring. And if people are ready to step in based on that, then they'll step in and we'll keep moving. But I don't, I don't, I don't waste time trying to talk people out of their demons. All right. Yes, Chrissy, you can still practice Reiki if you're a cancer patient. Absolutely. If you are drained all the time, drained frequently, then I would say spend more time on yourself than you spend on other people. You're, when you're offering Reiki, you're also receiving and you're putting yourself in the relaxed state, in a relaxed state. So it's actually good for you. And there's also a line, you know, like if you're totally drained and you should be sleeping instead, you should not be trying to offer any service to other people. Hope that makes sense. Yeah. All right. If there's any other questions, go ahead and pop them in the comments. I love to answer questions. And I'll be back next week. Next week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I will do another series. It's the three M's, <laughs> money or mindset, myths, and money in regards to healers and holding space, not just for others, but for themselves. Three important topics that need to be covered, mindset, myths, and money for the healer. That'll happen next week. And the Healers Collective officially opens on Monday. It's a uh, the first time I'm running it, the program in this way. So there's going to be an offer to join us at a really super special rate. If you're a healer who wants to take your work in the world, you want to get in on this, or at least you want to find out if it's a better, if it's a good fit for you. 
because once it opens, it'll close when we're full and then we'll roll for six months and it won't, I won't, it won't be, there won't be an ongoing enrollment. All right, we've got another question here. My foster son is new in recovery from addiction, suffers from severe anxiety and PTSD, very re recently lost his biological father, afraid of things like meditation. How old is your foster son, Vanessa? I would want to know how old he is. And um, we always meet people where they're at. Whenever I've done work with children, well, I don't do shamanic healing work with children unless I know their parents and we have an agreement and they know how to follow up, right? So I just don't like do this kind of deep level work with just anybody. Just, well, I don't do deep level work with children unless there's a container to hold them. If you're talking about doing something like, okay, so it's not a child. Okay, so this person is an adult. That's helpful. That is helpful. Um, he's afraid of things like meditation because he's anxious and overwhelmed. Yeah, I probably wouldn't. I probably would start out something. I would probably start out with a Reiki practice for somebody like that. I would do a little Reiki on them, help them to calm their nervous system, and then go from there. Yeah, but if he's too afraid, then maybe it's not time. Yeah. Conversations, relationship building is most important, I think, before you introduce something that somebody could be afraid of. Probably what he needs from what I'm just reading about him is mental health support. Definitely, and I'm sure you probably already have a therapist for him, but a therapist, particularly someone who specializes in grief, would probably be good. And then going from there. All right. So, all right. This segment was a little longer than normal, um, which happens sometimes, but I try to keep them 20 minutes. So things you need to know. Healers Collective opens Monday. If you want more information, you haven't connected, private message me. I'll make sure you get the information. This is not something that I'm looking to like make everybody join. I'm very selective about who comes in because I want to make sure that you're the right fit for this. So message me if you haven't. And next week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time, I'll be back in with um, Mindset Money and Myths. Mindset, myths, and money for healers. All right. Thank y'all. Have a beautiful day.